The title of this message is The Gospel of John is Purpose Driven. The Gospel of John is Purpose Driven. Part 2 The Just Jesus Evangelistic Campaign, Day 360. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Jesus John chapter 20 verses 30 and 31 just Jesus and many other signs John writes truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing that is in him, ye might have life through his name. Amen, somebody. Holy Father, God, we praise you and we thank you for the magnificent days that have led up to this wonderful Christmas Day. And Lord, we pray for all Christians to be rejoicing in you today and enjoying this day of grace and mercy and love. And Holy Father God, we thank you for the privilege to be able to continue to preach your Holy Word today now for the 360th time, the glorious gospel of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, why you came. You came to die on the cross for our sins as the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world and you rose again on the third day to save our wretched and ungodly souls. And we thank you for that. And for Jesus Christ's sake, as your Christian children, please forgive us of our sins, our failures, and our faults. And fill us with the anointing, the unction, and the power of your Holy Spirit for we cannot function without your unction, uh, Lord, without your anointing and without your power, nothing worthwhile will happen here today. And so, Lord, make your gospel plain, save that soul that is nearest to hell, and revive every Christian, and glorify your holy name, and lift up your holy Son, Jesus Christ, on this Christmas day. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, and for his sake, amen. You may be seated. Fix that now. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Frederick Buchner said, for millions of people, the birth of Jesus made possible not just a new way of understanding life, but a new way of living it. It is a truth that for 20 centuries, there have been untold numbers of men and women who in untold uh, ways and untold numbers of ways have been so grasped by the child Jesus who was born so caught up in the message he taught and the life he lived that they have found themselves profoundly changed by their relationship with him if you know that is true, say amen, somebody. Beloved, in the last Bond movie, Spectre uh, there is a scene where James Bond calls Money Penny and asks her to look up information on a person 
whom everyone believes is dead. James Bond says, check his files before and after his death. Money Penny responds incredulously, after his death, what are you talking about? And Bond says, just do it. Of course, it seems odd <clears throat> to look for information on a person after they have died. But in order to get the full story on Jesus Christ, we must look at the records before and after his death. And that is what John provides us in his purpose-driven gospel. Amen, somebody. As we learned in our last message, part one, the gospel of John is purpose-driven. John wrote his gospel with a divine purpose. In his account of all of Jesus' words and deeds, his purpose was to convince the readers of the gospel to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. As we learned, believe as we learn means to commit one's trust unto someone, to have faith in someone. Why should a person believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? For, for this was the purpose of John writing one of the most powerful works in the history of the world, the Gospel of John. What happens when a person believes in Jesus Christ? John says that believing you might have life through his name. Believing in Christ results in life, yea, eternal life. John wrote his gospel so that he might begin a relationship with the living Savior, the operative word being living. Historians try to collect and record everything they possibly can about dead individuals. They aim to create as complete a record as possible, but that is not what John does. As he stated, there were many things that he did not write about. In other words, he edited it. Instead, he tells us enough about Christ to introduce us to him. He gave us enough information so that we can understand who Jesus is and what Jesus is about. That he is the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world, your sins and mine. Amen, somebody. He wants us to begin a personal relationship with the living Christ. For that is when things begin to happen in your life. If you would trust Christ as your Savior, if you would allow him to live on the inside of you, that's when life begins for real. And in so doing, we will get to know him better. We will not need books to tell us everything about him because we will know him ourselves personally and up front. This personal relationship with Christ results in life, yea, life eternal. 
Life is an important word in the Gospel of John. John uses it at least 36 times. If we gain life through Jesus Christ, yea, eternal life, it implies that we are dead without Christ. Amen, somebody. And we know it's true. I feel sorry for people who refuse Christ. I feel sorry for people who reject Jesus Christ. I really do not know how they make it without him. Modern psychology teaches that people are sick, mentally ill, or imbalanced. And that they can be healed with the right counseling teaching, ideas, practices, therapy, or lifestyle changes. And all those things, I would suppose, are well and dandy. But without Christ, they're meaningless. They really will not help anybody without the Lord Jesus Christ in their lives. The Bible teaches that man in his natural state is an animated corpse, if you will. One of the true walking dead. A zombie. Thus, I guess, the interest in zombies of which I do not have one ounce of interest in anything dealing with zombies. But they're the walking dead. You see, haven't you uh, looked at the wonderful zombie movies and series that are going on today and read the zombie books and so forth? I have not, not one iota, not one word. And uh, I assure you, I never will. I have no interest in such foolishness. However, I have some church members who might have a little interest uh, in it. And they, they sneak and do uh, such foolishness. May God forgive them and may God help them. And only Christ, beloved, can make you alive. That is what John means when he says we gain life through his name by believing on him. Thus the purpose driven gospel that explains and points out truths about Jesus. So that dead men can live again. The name of Jesus encompasses his entire person, all that he is and all that he wants us to be. We cannot find true eternal life outside of Christ. It doesn't happen that way. Those of you who are searching and searching and you're going here and there, you'll never find peace. You'll never find joy. You, you will never find contentment until you come to Jesus and you trust him as your savior. Amen, somebody. What does this life entail? And Dr. Warren Worsby stated, eternal life is not endless time necessarily. For even lost people are going to live forever in hell. Eternal life means the very life of God experienced today and in the future. It is a quality of life and not a quantity of time necessarily. He continues, it is the spiritual experience of heaven on earth today. I shared with some folks yesterday, I don't know why God did it. But it uh, was the greatest Christmas Eve I've ever had in my life in almost 40 years of serving Christ. 
I literally experienced heaven on earth to the point I had to ask God to, to and I know there are other Christians who, who have had this experience too. This is my second time having this full experience. I literally had to ask God with tears in my eyes, please don't bless me anymore. What he was doing in my soul was heaven on earth. I don't know if it's because he was pleased that I preached the gospel every day this year. I don't know what was going on. And I dare not try to explain every bit of it to you because some of you will not believe it. Some of you will believe it and be jealous and envious. And then some will think I'm bragging. So that's why I don't say too much about stuff like this. But I'm here to tell you that God will give you uh, a joy in your soul and a peace in your soul and a spirit of gratitude that your physical body cannot handle. It's just overflowing. If you would trust Christ as your Savior, you will experience that joy and that peace in your life. Indeed, it is heaven on earth. I have eternity in my soul right now. It is impossible for me to enjoy life any more than I am enjoying it right now because of Christ. When you get to the point where you're dead to the world and the flesh and the devil and all you want is Christ and you want to serve him, uh, dear friends, and, and, and really, it, it would be okay for you to go ahead on to heaven. Now you're really living. You're living now. Real life in Christ. And so, ladies and gentlemen, the Christian does not have to die to have this eternal life. Can somebody say amen? He possesses it. In Christ today. That's what I'm talking about. That is what I am experiencing. And that's what you can experience. You don't have to die and go to heaven to enjoy Christ and enjoy your life. And I, I, I told some folks yesterday, I'm just, I feel sorry for these Christians who are down in the mouth and sad and pitiful. Something is wrong somewhere. There's sin in the camp. There's sin in your tabernacle. In your body, your heart is not right. There's sin in your past that you've never dealt with. And God knows it. And God knows the person you offended. And every time you try to pray, God will pop that person's head right in front of you because you're not right with that person. It may be a mother, it may be a father, it may be a child, it may be a husband, it may be a wife. Your heart is not right and you know it and God is going to remind you and remind you and remind you until you get it right. For those of you who are saved and you're supposed to be having the same joy today, the same peace. Merry Christmas. Is it a Merry Christmas for you? Think about that word Merry. That means joyful. It means happiness. It means cheerful. I feel sorry for Christians today. No matter what your family situation is, if you are a child of God, unless you need to make something right with that husband you divorced prematurely, with that wife you divorced and separated from, uh, with those children you scattered from California to New York, running around meeting all kinds of family members that are not even related to them because of your selfishness, because you wanted to be with your girlfriend, because you wanted to be with your new beau. And now on Christmas with your children scattered, with your original husband and your original wife halfway across the country, Cuddle up with another devil that's in your mind. Now you're mad. Now you're envious. Now you're jealous. Now uh, you're sitting by the fireside crying 
because of the sins you committed as a Christian, because you refused to obey God. Merry Christmas. I'm talking to millions of Christians who ought to have this unspeakable joy flowing up out of their souls and spirits, uncontrollable, like a rushing mighty fire. This peace that you ought to have that passeth all understanding. Dear Christ Christian friend, Merry Christmas. There were lost people who said to you while you were in Trader Joe's, while you were at the mall, there were lost people when you running materialistically after one last Jingle Bell sale. Merry Christmas. And you couldn't even say it back. It almost broke you down to your knees because the family members you should have on beside you are not there. Why? Because of your selfishness, because of your meanness, because of your anger, because of your bitterness, because of your foolishness, your pride and your stubbornness. Merry Christmas. By the way, this is not in the sermon. This is free. For all of you Christians who should be saying Merry Christmas all over the place. You can't say it because of your own wickedness, your own evil, your own pride, your own unwillingness to confess your sins and apologize, come what may. My God, my God, Merry Christmas. Yes, some of you need to get off of that couch and you need to go visit somebody right now today. They flying today. Buses are rolling today. You don't have to wait till Monday. You can email somebody something and what's wrong with your phone? Call somebody that you have not called in 30 years. Call somebody that you have not spoken to in 15 years, that you know your heart is not right with. Merry Christmas. You might have some joy by the end of the day. Merry Christmas. Call somebody. Do it. Stop looking on your phone, looking at strangers, emailing you stuff about what kind of presents they got and how happy they are and they snugged up together with their married partner and so forth and so on and you are sad and crying on the couch because you refuse to call your original husband and say, you know what, I'm sorry. It's not a Merry Christmas for me today. I'm sorry. I was not the wife, I was not the woman I was not the girlfriend I should have been to you. And you're with somebody else today, and I hope it's a Merry Christmas for you. But I want to make it right, even though we may not be able to get back together, I want to make it right. How about it, husband, father who walked out last year because you found some young thing down on the job. Mama had put on some pounds and she didn't have control over the children, as she should have in your mind. You just walked out, moved into a little old efficiencies apartment with one toilet and one bed, and that's it, with this young thing. Now you feel like a fool. You, you've lost everything. Why don't you call that original wife of yours and your four children and say it's not a Merry Christmas for me because I did wrong and I want to apologize. I want to make it right. We might not be able to get back together again but if that is possible let's do it. I'm repenting right now. I'm turning around. I'm ready to come home. Maybe by the end of the day you might have some joy. 
Because, dear sir, nothing can bring you joy like those little children on Christmas Day, hugging your neck and uh, saying, Papa, and, and grabbing your hand, and, and uh, like my little baby daughter does me, and she's 13 years old, uh, nothing for her to grab my neck and hug me and say, I love you, Papa, and squeeze me like I'm a big teddy bear. Sir, get on that iPhone, stop looking at pornography, and call your original wife and your children and wish them a Merry Christmas and apologize before you do it. They might invite you over for dinner tonight. You, got a few more, you, you, have, you, you have a few more hours. You say, well, preacher, I didn't bargain for all of this today on Christmas Day. Uh, I, I did not plan on preaching it. God is telling me to say it to you. Because there are millions who are not having a Merry Christmas today because their hearts are not right. I thank God for the remnant, the Christians who are experiencing joy unspeakable, peace that pass of all understanding because of Christ on Christmas. And by the way, Christ makes a difference. He ought to make a difference in your home. My wife and I are not together for some 30 years because of us. We are together for 30 something years because of Jesus and Jesus alone. Because I told her before we got married, either we're going to do it God's way or no way. And I meant that. It's only by the grace of God we're still together. But I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. And there are thousands of other Christian couples who would say the same thing. And by the way, it gets better if you're willing to do better. Amen, somebody. And so, ladies and gentlemen, back to the original message. Yeah, certainly, you desire this kind of life. John invites all people to come out of the cold, dark world and into the warmth brightness and light of Christ are you concerned about your sins they have been taken care of on the cross by who Jesus Christ the Lamb of God who has taken away the sins of the world yours and mine as you can imagine now as you know now Hearing me preach all year long, I love that phrase, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who took away the sins of the world. All you have to do is believe in him. All I have to do is believe in him. All I can say is glory. We sung a song last night, I'll fly away. I feel like singing it right now. I wish I was a singer like my dad who's in heaven right now watching me. Daniel White Jr., God bless you. Merry Christmas. Are you worried? Are you afraid? Christ gives peace. Oh, yes, he does. Are you looking for a new direction in your life? Christ gives purpose. Are you weak and downtrodden, depressed, defeated, and disgusted, and full of despair? Christ gives power to overcome all things in him, and he'll give you hope, real hope. And not the hope that the politicians talk about, but real hope. One of the verses frequently quoted around Christmas time each year is from Isaiah. For Isaiah said it well when he said, The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Somebody ought to shout amen right there at the word of God. The light is not a thing, but a person. His name is Jesus. Jesus Christ, the one whose birth we commemorate on this day at Christmas. He stated, I am the light of the world. The Bible states in him is life. And that life is the light of men. Amen, somebody. His name is Jesus. Emmanuel. God with us. 
the Alpha and the Omega, the Lily of the Valley, the Bright and Morning Star, Mary's baby, the King of Kings, his name is Jesus. He'll change your life. If he can change my life and save me, he can save you and change your life. Earlier in his gospel, the name, uh, John said, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth, my God, my God, on him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, dear friend, right now, and you can have eternal life. You can have life more abundantly, even today. Charles Wesley, whose apartment I had the privilege of visiting some years ago over in England, the greatest, one of the greatest songwriters, hymn writers of all time. He said these words, Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins release us. Let us find new life in thee. Born thy people to deliver, born a child and yet a king, born to reign in us forever, now thy gracious kingdom bring. Amen, somebody. By thine own eternal spirit rule in all our hearts alone, by thine own sufficient merit raise us to thy glorious throne. Believe in Jesus Christ today, dear friend, and let him set you free from your sins and from your fears. Let him give you eternal life on Christmas Day. Here's how. First, beloved, accept the fact that you are a sinner and that you have broken God's law. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Second, accept the fact that there is a penalty, there is a punishment for sin always. I have to tell you this bad news on Christmas Day so that you can fully appreciate the good news. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. We die every day. We die physically because of our sins. Before this beautiful Christmas Day is over, a thousand souls will die and enter out into eternity or more. Folks who were flying from Russia to go sing some Christmas songs to the troops down in Syria, almost a hundred are dead and in eternity right now. One was a beautiful couple, uh, either newly married or getting ready to get married. But there was one lady saved, one man saved, because he went to the desk and his passport uh, was expired. He could not get on the plane. So one, that's what salvation means, being saved from death. Saved from physical death, in this case, saved from spiritual death is what Jesus did for you. That's the plane you need to get on. The Jesus plane. Amen, somebody. And thirdly, accept the fact that you are on the road to hell. If you die unsaved, if you die without believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, dear friend, you're going to hell. Yes, even on Christmas Day. You say, uh, Jesus never preached on hell. Yes, he did. Jesus preached more on hell than anybody else in the Bible. Why do you think he died on the cross for our sins? To save us from annihilation? No, sir. To save us from a burning hell. Jesus Christ preached more on hell than he did about heaven, by the way. For he said in Matthew 10, 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. 
Now hell is bad news. But I'm thankful on this Christmas morning, as the old black preachers used to say, while the blood is yet running warm in your veins, and the air is still in your lungs, I have some good news for you on Christmas Day. And Jesus Christ uttered these words as well, for he said, For God so loved the world, that includes you. You sitting on that couch because your grandmother has you listening to me right now. Your grandmother who loves your soul, not only enough to buy you some toys and an Xbox, but loves you so much she'll take the Xbox from you for a minute while this crazy preacher preaches the gospel to you. I know you got them lined up on the couch, grandmother. God bless you. Your mother who has you sitting beside her looking at me right now on your new phone. She did it because she loves you. This is the first message she wants you to get on that new phone. That big old beautiful iPhone that you know you don't deserve, but you got it. Jesus said it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. His name is Jesus. He was talking about himself. That whosoever, that means anybody at any time, believeth on him or in him should not perish. Where? In hell. But have everlasting life where? In heaven. Amen, somebody. That's good news on Christmas Day. Just believe in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that he died for your sins, was buried and rose from the dead by the power of God for you. So that you can live forever with him. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. It's already done, dear friend. It's already done, dear friend. You don't have to do anything. But, but preacher, no, but nothing. You don't have to do anything. It's already done. Jesus said it is finished. All you have to do is believe on him. Trust in him. Ask him to save your soul. He'll do it. If he can save my wretched soul, he can save yours. Pray and ask him to come into your heart and save your soul. For uh, the Bible says in Romans chapter 10 verse 9. That if thou, you shall confess with thy, your mouth, the Lord Jesus. And shall believe in thine heart, your heart. That God hath raised him from the dead. Thou, you, shalt be saved. Do you believe it? I know you do. Do you believe in Christ? I know you do. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. These are the two verses that did it for me. For you see, beloved, I thought I had to join the church to get saved. I thought I had to shake the preacher's hand in the right hand of the fellowship and take a chair to be saved. I thought I had to get on the mourner's bench and cry out and scream out and say very fast over and over again, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Yes, they had me on the mourner's bench. I thought I had to get baptized at the age of 12. I did all of that, was still lost and on my way to hell. Went down a dry center, came up a wet center on my way to hell with water on my back. I thought I had to do good things to get saved. No, no, none of that. I found out December the 19th, 1979, all I had to do was believe on Christ. He paid it all. Amen, somebody. That's all you have to do on Christmas Day. Dear friend, if you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose again, you believe that in your heart right now, please pray with me what we call the sinner's prayer and mean it from your heart phrase by phrase. Repeat after me. Holy Father God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I realize that I have sinned against you and broken your laws. For Jesus Christ's sake, please forgive me of all of my sins past. As I now believe with all of my heart in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died for me, was buried, and rose again. 
Lord Jesus, please come into my heart and save my soul. For I believe that you're the Lamb of God who took away my sins, was buried and rose again. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to repent of my sins past as I believe on you and help me to follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus Christ's name I pray and for his sake, amen. Jesus save you, Jesus will save you, just now come to Jesus, come to Jesus, just now, just now come to Jesus. Come to Jesus just now. Ladies and gentlemen, if you believed in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ, you believe that he died for your sins, was buried and rose again, allow me to say congratulations on trusting the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. For you have done the most important thing in life, and I assure you that you will never regret it. For more information to help you grow in your newfound faith in Christ, please go to GospelLightSociety.com and read my pamphlet, What to Do, after you enter through the door. Jesus Christ said in John 10, 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture.